Raymond Diamond, who is the principal of St Clair's College at Waverley, uh, Darren, New South Wales chapter. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Aura Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, also, before we begin, I just want to put a little plug out there for our, our regional day out, which is coming up in um, November. So it's going to be held in Parramatta, and the theme of our regional day out is connecting people and place. So it'll be held at the Notel Hotel in Parramatta, and then we've got a lot of um, really exciting venues to visit. So keep an eye out for that one. So back to this event. Um, I've personally had the pleasure of working with this inspiring lady, um, so I'm sure that she, you will find what she has to say this afternoon very inspiring as well so I'll hand over to um, Darren and Kerry thank you thanks Joe and good afternoon everyone it's an incredible privilege to be able to uh, to join you this afternoon for another one of our in conversation webinars uh, this afternoon I have the incredible privilege of uh, of introducing you to Kerry who has started as a colleague some time ago and has quickly become a friend and, uh, and that's the joy of working in the education sector is that actually we share a common passion and that is to see young people thrive, flourish and fulfill their incredible potential. And so, uh, so I've really enjoyed the numerous, numerous conversations I've had with Kerry. And she gave me a bio on herself that was about 15 pages long. So I'm just gonna pick out the highlights, okay, for this afternoon. So <laughs> Kerry was appointed the principal of St. Clair's College in 2021. Prior to this, Kerry had held the role of assistant principal since 2015. She was also the leader of pedagogy at Maris College Cogra and had the opportunity to impact the formative years of teacher practice as a lecturer in the education faculty at the University of Notre Dame. In these roles, Kerry has delivered energy and innovation to college communities through a dedicated and professional approach to whole school change and improvement. And I can absolutely vouch for that. <laughs> Kerry demonstrates strength in organizational and strategic planning and the diversity of her knowledge allows her to effectively build the capacity of both staff and students. With over 23 years of teaching experience, Kerry has adopted a passionate, innovative and reflective approach to curriculum, pedagogy and the development of teacher capacity, which is why we get on so well, because we enjoy talking about those things together. And it is through an ongoing commitment to a future focused approach to learning and a commitment to education. Educational transformation has resulted in significant growth in student outcomes and whole school pedagogical change, which is what we're going to hear a lot about this afternoon, I hope. Kerry's actions are characterised by a commitment to a growth mindset and the realisation of the potential of all members of the school community. And most recently, Kerry McDiamond was named one of Australia's most influential educators for 2022. The educator recognised the top 50 educators in the country have had the strongest impact in creating a reformative teaching and learning culture in the last 18 months. And this accolade and leadership success is further recognised with St Clair's College for the second consecutive year nominated as an excellence awardee in the 2022 Australian Education Awards for Secondary School of the Year, non-government. And she is doing amazing things at that school. And I've had the opportunity to work with her students who are just next level in, uh, in their approach to life and education. And so I'm really excited to hear what Kerry has to uh, share with us this afternoon. So Kerry, thank you for joining us. We're three quarters away through term three. Wellbeing is potentially at a bit of a dip. And, uh, and so this afternoon, we're really keen to hear from your, your, uh, your own experiences. And so I'm going to hand it over to you. And at the end of this, I invite you to, to put your questions into the chat function. And, uh, and Kerry and I are really looking forward to being able to have a Q&A with equally passionate educators as, uh, as we go about the transformational uh, impact in young people's lives. So Kerry, thanks for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you for the next 40 minutes or so. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Let's see if I haven't forgotten how to do this. Uh, COVID's taught us one thing. It's taught us how to Zoom and share screens. Okay. Um, look, I just want to talk to you a little bit today. Um, it's a real privilege to be here and to, to have this opportunity to be able to speak to you. Um, really, I want to talk about this whole notion of engagement and, and how do we move beyond the, the traditional classroom. And it was really interesting for me to have this conversation with my staff and particularly my leadership team. Again, at the start of this year, I gathered them together and we 
We, um, in the in light of a new building that we've um, we've purchased, and I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit later. We we had this conversation around um, engagement and what do we do to ensure that we really are responding to the challenges that the students um, are facing in our world today. And so I showed them this little video, and I thought I'd show this clip to you as well. So for me, I think that really speaks to, I can pause that, that actually really speaks to the, the whole notion of um, the environment in which our students are headed. Um, and it, it means that we need to have a different approach to learning. It means that we need to um, make sure that we are keeping up with this flexible, um, rapidly changing environment that our students um, are walking into. So we, we've got to have a different approach to the ones that we've seen um, our parents um, live through. Um, and unfortunately, that's not we aren't necessarily always keeping up um, and making sure that we are adapting. Um, for me, that means we need to actually not just think outside the box, but as educators, it's time for us to start leading outside the box. Um, and we have to sort of take on that challenge of moving beyond some of those traditional structures that we see in our school contexts um, and look at um, what we can be doing um, to be providing learning experiences for students that really are going to prepare them for all of those challenges that we just saw, but prepare them in a way that actually makes them valuable contributors to the world um, and you know, ensure that we've got that sense of equity that exists also um, in terms of how they interact with each other um, and interact um, with what they do beyond the school. So really for us at St. Clair's, it was about making sure that we're creating future ready students, um, those students who are gonna thrive in their future life work. Um, and that they're going to take on all those challenges um, and really make a, a positive contribution to this ever-changing world that we find ourselves in. Um, and I think, you know, for us, we, need to, we needed to have another look at, well, what's the purpose of education? Often the, the focus sits with that whole notion of attainment um, and, you know, that the ATAR, getting across the finish line um, at the end of the HSC. Um, what we were moving towards was that notion of um, developing those future ready students, those students who are going to have, um, be passionate, be inquisitive, have the entrepreneurial skills that are going to really allow them to be lifelong, um, long, lifelong learners. And for us, you know, it meant that how can we actually have a look at what we're teaching, how we're teaching, um, what are the spaces in which we teach look like, and how can we actually adopt a little bit more of a porous approach to curriculum um, that doesn't sit in those box parameters? Um, you know, how are we creating a learning environment that is really going to be um, moving away from um, moving towards mastering content rather than um, getting through content? Um, and, you know, for us, it was about really igniting passion in students. Um, it was about leveraging networks, leveraging communities. How can we ignite the passion that we sit, that sits inside all of our students so that we can ensure that they're um, 
feeling a sense of joy when they're coming to school. Often we see those passions exist in that um, co-curricular space. And for us, it was about bringing this into the classroom more readily. And we were doing that by ensuring that we've got this real world authentic learning lens that is definitely future focused, that, that has a tendency to really blur the lines between the formal and informal curriculum um, and making sure that we're creating a space for learning that's really responsive to this type of approach. I mean, it also means, you know, moving in partnership with people in our system, but moving in partnership with tertiary institutions, um, moving in partnership with those who work in the industry space, engaging in hybrid types of learning that really allows us to bring um, what the our external world has and the, and the benefits of all of those um, institutions that we see sitting outside of the classroom. How do we bring them in? How do we work with them in collaboration with them um, to ensure we really are providing um, a truly engaging, truly relevant learning experience um, for the students that are sitting in our classrooms? So um, I pose this to the staff, the World Economic Forum has a really good um, and a really interesting framework that they've put together that asks us to look at what does high quality learning look like in the fourth industrial revolution. And we, we placed this on the table and asked our staff to have a look at um, um, all of these elements. Are we really leveraging those innovative pedagogies that are going to ensure that we've got this experience that we want students to have? And you know, what are we doing with, the, with that content building? Are we building in mechanisms that is going to build those skills and those dispositions for creativity, innovation? Do we have a lens on learning that allows them to look outward, um, that they've got this awareness of the wider world, um, that they're playing an active role in that? Um, and really importantly, and perhaps most importantly in this post-COVID context, that those interpersonal skills, um, how are we making sure that we're building um, negotiation, empathy, leadership, social awareness? How are we building that sense of emotional intelligence um, in students and really making sure that we are um, having a personalised approach to learning that's accessible to everybody. So that framework was um, really helpful for us when we had a conversation around our approach to learning and how we're leveraging those pedagogies that we're seeing to ensure that we are building skills and dispositions in students. I suppose for us too, it was about really making sure that we um, have this approach that means that we've got targeted innovation. We've got these competing tensions and discourses that exist in our system. You know, we're um, held to account by things such as the HSC, um, league tables, um, making sure that we um, get our students to achieve the most, um, you know, to, to actually be successful in that post school game as well. Um, and how do we meet in the middle? How do we make sure that we are ensuring that we're providing a learning landscape that really is innovative, that really is something that is going to be allowing our students to be completely engaged in the learning experience while still meeting um, all the rigours and the expectations that sit in that, um, in that standardised discourse that we all have to answer to um, in a number of ways. So for us, I, I, we we talk about targeted innovation, targeted um, targeted interventions that we put in, in place. We want to make sure that we are innovating based on need, um, and that we've got this strategic intent um, in, in our mind as we go through and um, make sure that the things that we do um, are highly relevant for our students. So uh, there's a little video that um, we've put together that sort of gives you a bit of an overview of what we do and why we do it. And I'll show you that. And then I'll talk through um, some more of our initiatives after we've watched that. Educating students for the unknown is an exciting and necessary challenge. At a time where knowledge is exploding at an exponential rate, our aim is to give students the skills to apply their knowledge and understanding to ever-changing circumstances inside and outside the classroom. Our response is to reimagine learning in a secondary school context and to provide opportunities for students to engage in learning experiences that prepare them for all the transitional moments in their educational journey. We are committed to an approach that moves beyond surface learning, getting through the content or covering the course. 
we must adopt a learning focus that allows students to apply their in-school learning to real and authentic situations as independent, creative and critical learners. We want our students to understand themselves as learners and the process of their learning. This type of focus requires students to work in a variety of contexts on a learning pathway that reflects and builds upon their strengths. Young people face a post-school experience that is increasingly evolving and this requires us to develop students who are agile and adaptable enough to confront both the disruption and opportunities of social change and technological advancement. St. Clair's provides students with learning material and assessments that allow us to express our creativity and entrepreneurship. Just recently, because of the ideas I developed through assignments at school, I was able to publicly share through competitions a short film I made with a group addressing the need for change in regards to global warming. I also had the opportunity to represent all Sydney Catholic schools in a STEM MAD event, showcasing an innovation I made addressing the contemporary situation of homelessness. Sinclair's provides us with exciting learning opportunities that have the ability to progress our ideas outside of school, allowing us to explore real world problems. St. Clair's offers an innovative learning environment that provides us with unique experiences to prepare us for the ever-changing world ahead. In our iSEM class, Olivia and I were able to create our fast fashion reducing app, Thrista. The school saw its potential and have immediately supported us on taking the next steps for it. So far, we have won a national competition, spoken at conferences in front of tech professionals, and we're currently working hard with an Apple developer to try and launch it on the App Store. We want our students to be agents of change who possess the necessary leadership and entrepreneurial skills to meet the challenges that await them. St. Clair's graduate is a student who is ready to take on these challenges and make a difference in their world. So really our approach is this, uh, in order to achieve some of those things, we have a, a, a pretty explicit focus um, on learning. In stage four, we undertake some really targeted integrated projects. So we collapse the curriculum um, and part of what we do then twice a year for an entire term um, is that the girls undertake projects that have a real world learning lens. So in year seven, they undertake something called post Earth Pioneers. They come, um, they have a discussion around why and how we should potentially move beyond Earth. Um, and colonize Mars or another another planet outside our um, outside of Earth. Uh, in those projects, we do things like we collaborate with NASA. So the girls in that project had an opportunity to meet Alice Bowman. Um, she zoomed in and was part of our launch day. Uh, she ran the mission to Pluto, um, and so she, it was a really great opportunity for the girls to see and be asked, be inspired um, by some of these amazing people um, in our community in our world. Um, we also have a sustainability focus in Year 7 and you would have seen one of the girls there talk about um, a project that she undertook in that space. Um, and then in Year 8 we have our People and Technology Unit where the girls actually create, use technology to create um, an opportunity to help people in our community. So the focus around that project is how can technology enhance our local community. I mean, the girls engage in a number of initiatives that are that have a real world application. Um, and you can see that some of them actually take those products to market. They have an opportunity to engage um, with tertiary institutions, with external experts. Um, they come in for a, an entire launch day um, and work with these people and and an ongoing mentorship program happens throughout the projects where the girls then um, have an opportunity to showcase, to pitch their ideas and then potential, potentially take those ideas further um, and to, to market. In stage five, we have um, a, a future focus lens in our iSTEM class. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about an initiative that we ran recently um, with our iSTEM girls who had the privilege of presenting um, to Sydney Catholic schools and some industry experts. Um, and so that is a real focus in stage five. How can we actually work with industry um, within our KLAs um, to ensure that the girls have a real understanding um, of what learning can look like for them in all those transitional phases. So in year seven, when I'm doing this post-Earth Pioneers project, I'm working with um, 
I'm working with NASA, I'm working with our aerospace engineer who is our integrator at school. Um, and I'm getting an understanding of, of what that type of learning can lead to in stage five, in stage six, and then in a post-school context. So those projects are really important, are a really important part of what we do and who we are in terms of providing that authentic future focused lens to learning. And in stage six, we, we do have approach, uh, an approach that reflects a blended learning um, agenda. We've got an expansion of those non-traditional offerings. Um, we have innovative ways to showcase learning at the school. And I think COVID really taught us that. Um, you'll see there in that presentation, which I can share with people later, um, we did a virtual showcase. So we, uh, we looked at um, virtual art galleries, for example, and, and had a conversation about how we can bring a virtual art gallery into our school context. And so that's something that um, we started in a COVID context, but is going to be an innovative way for us to showcase learning um, moving forward. And again, that focus on partnerships exists in stage six um, and hopefully allows our girls to have um, that real lens for what learning can bring them um, in a post-school context. So this is some of the projects that, that we run. Um, one of the really successful ones this year was that Lights, Camera, Hope in Action. Um, and, and our girls actually engaged in a um, film festival where they created a film and you would have seen Poppy, the girl in that video. She actually created a film that, that won an award um, that looked at a sustainability lens. We have a, another project called Be The Voice. The girls actually do a TED talk. Um, we still ran those integrated learning projects during COVID and it gave us a really good insight into some of the possibilities around that hybrid learning space um, when it comes to projects and when it comes to learning and how we can, you know, be more porous in our approach to the curriculum. So that big, big data, big impact um, integrated learning unit actually works um, between English and mathematics. So they unpack data and, um, and have a conversation around how that can actually help them to um, have an impact in the world, how they can use and leverage that data to be the voice for change in their own context. Um, we do a lots of robotics and we do a sun sprint challenge. We've actually have been really fortunate to um, work with Patrick Lindsay and the girls did a, um, a documentary on the Lost Diggers of Fromel, again, bringing, um, you know, those external experts into the classroom, working with our girls in collaboration with them um, to ensure that learning remains real and relevant. And you'll see up there our Year 9 designer, designer technology girls um, were working, had the absolute privilege of working with LEAF Architects um, on a project um, that actually um, looks at our building, making the connection between our building student voice um, and their own project. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a second. But for us, really, it's about making sure that we pay attention to all those conditions that lead um, us to success. And we have had lots of shiny moments and you see them on the top of the iceberg there. But for us, it's really about how do we actually create those conditions for success in a learning environment? How do we make sure um, that we have a sustainable approach to learning and teaching that creates, that builds capacity, but also creates opportunity for both students um, and staff. And you'll see that there are a number of things that we have in place, including our, um, you know, online learning platforms like Maths Pathways, it's intuitive. Um, we, we have Literata, which is a data platform, which does a lot of the um, data work for us behind the scenes. So we're all about making sure that our staff are able to leverage data and do something with the things that are given to them so that we can actually make sure that we do have that personalised approach to learning, that the academic rigour is there um, so that we can ensure that we have success um, in an ongoing way with our, with our staff and with our students. And, you know, we've all heard about this whole approach to learning, these, this whole idea that we need to make sure that, that change is definitely sustainable and um, given our current teaching landscape and, you know, the attrition rates that we absolutely see um, in the teaching profession at the moment, it's really important that we've got these structures that sit alongside some of the work that we do, the organisational structures, the professional learning structures, 
um, and some innovative leadership structures that are really going to allow us to support the work of teachers that we, you know, we've got a, a person that actually is in charge of innovation and partnerships and she goes out, um, makes connections, she works really closely with tertiary institutions. We have a, a leader of learning pathways who maps that work across our um, projects and across the curriculum. Um, we have a person who looks at data insights and professional practice. And, but I think one of the really exciting um, leadership opportunities that we've created this year was that whole notion of the learning integrator. Um, and these guys are one from each KLA, we give them a two lesson allocation on the timetable. Um, and it's these people that work within situ, within the KLA context that actually help to drive some of this amazing work that happens in terms of learning integration um, and the innovative structures and practices that we have in place. Um, and it's a real opportunity for them to showcase some of the amazing work that they're doing in the classroom. And um, you know, really building their leadership capacity as well. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of um, COVID was, and the teacher shortage, was this leveraging these lessons from lockdown. And um, we've actually trialed some work with a live Zoom-based mini lessons, but also looking at how we can actually create this synchronous and asynchronous learning environment that sort of, you know, can not just... Um, allow us to bring teacher experts into the room, but also industry experts into the room so that we look a little bit differently at who it is that is the teacher um, in front of our um, classes. And so um, you'll see this the, on the right hand side there, this is our maths teacher. He's, he was our innovation guy. He, he retired um, and we had a significant shortage in our in terms of our math staff a couple of our one of our staff members got injured another one um, was out for a long period of time and so we we trialed this whole idea of using um, those pre-recorded mini lessons um, the online platform and then having our teacher just step in in timetabled lessons rather than having to be here on site um, all the way through the timetable, he just stepped in and he ran live Zoom based lessons with the girls based on need. Um, and it was a really exciting um, opportunity for us to see how well that worked, given that we've, you know, these kids have come out of, uh, of a COVID context, but that blended approach, and particularly an approach like that really allowed us to open up what learning could look like. Um, from a, a, a context that, you know, a, con a deficit context, something really important and really um, exciting seemed to um, come out of that. And, you know, this is a really good way for us to be bringing in um, some more industry experts um, into our classroom contexts, um, take some of that pressure off teachers, but also think a little bit creatively um, about what we can be doing um, in some of our learning contexts as well. Um, one of the really big lenses that we have is this whole notion of social entrepreneurship um, and making sure that we are developing in our students that lens that sits beyond themselves. I don't think it's ever been more important for our students um, to have a lens on learning and the world that actually sees them um, being actively engaged in learning beyond in the community, um, but also have a lens that sits um, with, a, with a view to make a difference in our world. And so this entrepreneurship um, focus that we have really allows our girls to be engaging in real world problem solving opportunities um, in order to develop their entrepreneurial thinking and learning skills, um, but also being able to have them share opportunities with um, mentors, both inside the school um, and outside the school. And what I wanted to share with you is one of those examples. So you'll see that, that girl there, Poppy White, she actually created um, one of our projects um, that she actually worked in was that year eight um, project, how can technology really um, enhance our community? So she actually engaged in a project where um, she was ignited by that passion to make a difference in the world um, of homelessness. Um, and she created a really interesting product um, that I'll share with you now.
maybe I won't. to help tackle the problem of homelessness. According to the last national census, there are 2,588 homeless people sleeping rough in New South Wales. This number has increased by 35% since the last census. 60% of homeless are men, 40% are women, 84% living in Sydney in a major urban areas, and these people are arguably the most disadvantaged in our society. The homeless have many needs that require our urgent attention, shelter, warmth, clothing, food, basic hygiene and healthcare, employment opportunities and financial support. There are many charities and innovative companies who are providing solutions for these things, but not one company is helping address the core problem that if sold, would actually help solve the other issue. This is the problem of not having a home address. Homeless people who are sleeping rough do not have an address. And the fact is, if you don't have a home address, then you can't have a bank account. Therefore, you can't get a job, and the government and homeless shelters cannot contact you with support. The irony of that is that homeless people need these things the most, yet not having an address is a barrier. It's a catch-22 situation. This is why I have designed the Shadow Address, an address that follows you, no matter where you are sleeping at night. And this is how it works. Every one of 2,500 homeless people who are sleeping rough in New South Wales will receive a Shadow Address wristband. The wristband is made from durable, recycled plastic that has a unique ID code that is able to be tracked anywhere in Australia via GPS technology. When a homeless person is applying for a job or needs a bank account, they provide them with their unique roaming address ID number that is linked to their band. The wristband acts like an address that follows you wherever you go, one that Australia Post can use to find your nearest lockbox when your post arrives. The homeless individual is notified when the post arrives via an LED light on the wristband which glows red. The homeless person then walks to the nearest lockbox and uses their wristband to open it and receive their post. Lockboxes are placed in places where homeless people choose to sleep, so if an individual moves to another location, they will always have a lockbox close to them. By accessing posts in this way, the homeless will now be able to receive bank, job and government information that have the potential to get their life back on track. So, why is the design suitable for the target market? The wristband is made from durable, long-lasting rubber and plastic that is waterproof and damage-proof. The wristband is branded with the logo of Shadow Address but also has the Australia Post logo on it to prove that this is a trustworthy product. This wristband provides the homeless population with a roaming address so that new opportunities like simply having a job or getting a bank account will now be possible and available to them. So that type of learning actually really empowers students to be making that difference that we talked about um, in their world. Um, and, you know, that's been a really successful part of some of the things that we've been working on at the school. Um, one of the really exciting initiatives that also reflects that um, connection that we make with industry is this new innovation hub that we have um, and have the privilege of working with LEAF Architects on. So the college has actually um, acquired this building that you see in this image here. Um, and this is really going to allow us to bring even, um, to bring to life that type of learning that you've just seen there. So the building itself is going to reflect that nexus between the world of work, post-school possibilities. It's going to have uh, an industry feel. Um, and we've been inspired by the loom down in Melbourne. Um, and we hope that this is going to have, it's going to be an immersive learning experience for students as they walk in and we're going to see digital technologies um, exist in that space. Um, we've called it um, the, the Lumos Centre um, and really part of who we are as a, as a Clarion community, St Clare is our um, patron saint, um, it, it, Clare means light. And really what we want to do is bring light and joy um, to the learning experience um, for the students as well. Um, and so we're really excited about the possibilities that are going to exist in this space. And as you walk through, the space itself is going to reflect the design thinking process. Um, and the girls have had a really unique opportunity to be able to work with the architects um, and to gain an insight into what it means um, to work in that industry. 
Um, so you can see the girls there, we filmed them working um, with the architects themselves. Um, Joe and the team did a really amazing presentation that gave them an understanding of all the processes and intricacies that go into um, working in that industry. Um, and the girls then um, had an opportunity to engage in an assessment task. So what they did was they used all of their skills that they gained um, and they um, and all of the, the the vision that has been given to them from the architects themselves, and they they were tasked um, with this design brief. The students were asked to actually create a pop up learning pod at the school. So um, they were going to design, produce, and evaluate this concept. Um, and the girls then pitched their ideas, and you can see Darren there, um, and you can see. Um, that they pitched their ideas to Daniel, myself and Darren. Um, and the girls did such an amazing job. They then uh, put their design ideas and their, um, their plans into um, a competition, the STEM MAD competition. And some of those girls were actually successful. Um, we had been also given a really amazing opportunity for these girls to then um, present to Sydney Catholic schools. Um, at a Sydney Catholic schools um, a meeting day, they had a, a team building day and you can see Darren there um, uh, introducing some of the girls as they produced some of their work in their pop-up learning pods. And I have to say the level and standard of work that the girls actually produced um, was just phenomenal. Um, and I won't click on it now, but if you click on this link, if I, you can share the presentation, you can, you can actually see the level um, of work that the girls were presenting. And so this is one of the pods that was um, very successful on that day. Um, the, the student was inspired by the notion of hexagon um, or those hexagons on the top of that building there are actually solar panels. Um, she talked to the engineering that re was required in, in the building of that pod, the flexible learning spaces. They undertook re international research. They um, surveyed students um, and the, the girls then came up with um, a pitch on the day to potentially um, build those pop-up learning pods in our system or potentially in our school. Um, and it was really exciting to be hearing student voice in that context. And I think that's a really important part um, of what we've been doing and who we are in terms of the learning agenda is bringing the student voice into the space um, so that we can actually make sure that the things that we do um, are continually engaging girls um, and making sure that their experience is real and relevant. Um, out of that um, out of that pitch, there have been a number of those girls who have said that they have now a real genuine interest in moving into, um, these girls are in year nine, um, and in moving into this particular industry moving forward, or at least a creative industry um, where they can actually be making a difference. I mean, with that in mind, we've actually looked at changing our, all of our stage five electives. So next year, the girls will undertake traditional electives for year nine, and these particular girls will go into year 10, um, and they'll be undertaking um, this reimagination of stage five electives. Some of them will be doing CSI, forensic science. Um, we have, you know, 10 minute musicals happening. Uh, we have uh, Archibald artists coming in and the girls will create portraiture to be put into the Young Archie Awards. But these are bespoke courses that actually allow our students to um, have a really good understanding of that pathway that's going to allow them to move beyond school. Um, you know, we're moving also into digital portfolio based assessment, micro credentialing. So that new exciting building that hopefully we get off the ground soon um, is going to have a cafe attached to it. And one of those stage five electives is going to be called Cafe Claire where they start a, a small business. Um, and, you know, they're going to be creating apps that allow the, uh, the allow staff to order coffees and, and that building, that business will run um, out of that new building as well. So that's about it from me in terms of just a, a bit of an overview of what we do and who we are. And my contact details are there if anybody um, wants to make contact with me to ask any questions or um, to you know, see if there's anything that's excited you that you would like to um, have a further conversation with us with. But look, it's been an absolute privilege to be able to speak with you here today. Um, and um, it's been an, an amazing opportunity for us to work with Leaf Architects and 
Um, I know I've been to a number of the LEA events and I've found them um, so rewarding and so inspiring. So, but thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Kerry. I am always inspired when I get to hear you talk so passionately about <laughs> education. And so, uh, look, you and I could talk all afternoon, but to everyone who is online with us, I really encourage you to go down into the Q&A section there and, uh, and post some of your questions um, or, you know, thoughts that you'd like to hear Kerry's perspectives on a little bit more because um, it's really a little bit different to how sort of, you know, other schools are operating. So Kerry, I do have a couple um, already that I'll, uh, that I'll throw to you. Um, so um, ISTEM run as an elective in stage five. Have you had any problems since it's been deregistered from the ROSA by NESA? Have you had any problems with parents in terms of students taking the ISTEM course? No, and actually we just did our launch of our new stage five electives because everything that we're about to create isn't going to be registered by NESA. Um, so the girls are actually going to undertake one, only one stage five elective that is going to be NESA accredited and sit on their ROSA. The rest are going to be school designed um, semesterized units that um, reflect this lens on learning moving forward. And actually uh, part of what we've done in that space is engage the parent body. Um, and we've got some really exciting um, opportunities to work with the parents and, and work also in collaboration with tertiary institutions in that space. But it's interesting, you open it up, parents yeah. are excited. Um, are they really? Yeah. Because no, I've got because I've got some questions on that because, um, you know, unlike most other, you know, a number of other schools, you're in a high performing area, you know, 29th in the state and ATARs matter and things like that. So how have your parents gone with sort of, you know, you're talking about, you know, it's not about attainment, it's better about learning and it's about innovation and creativity when I would suggest a number of your parents are probably more a little bit about consistency and logical thought and, you know, get yourself a consistent job. And, you know, actually let's be creative and innovative. How have they, how have they embraced all of this and what sort of process have you taken them on? Um, you know, we know that when students are engaged, um, they learn much more readily. Um, and it's not necessarily about, I, I talked in that video about that whole notion of covering content. Um, one of the conversations we had right from the beginning is content through skills. Um, and it's those skills and dispositions that we need to build in students that are just as, and if not, in, you know, just as important um, in terms of making sure that they become independent, critical thinkers. Um, and, you know, just like that, that slide showed you, you've got to have, with that iceberg, academic rigor needs to sit on at the bottom of that. We have a, a process in place where we, we target and map the non-negotiables. Um, girls need to make sure that they can write a decent paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, so academic rigor sits at the heart of what we do, um, but we have those foundational skills in place and it allows us to, to engage with, with this type of learning um, at the same time. Yeah, great, so why, why have you got them doing one uh, ROSA accredited? elective what was the thinking behind there oh in the first instance one elective is making sure that we don't change too quickly okay um so there but there is a desire and an interest in some yeah. of those traditional electives as well and you know they absolutely um have validity in terms of what we offer and what we do. Uh, so we're still offering those and it's obviously based on student choice. And if it comes out in the future, when we off we had 22 new electives that staff were so excited to get up and, and running. Um, and, you know, that we're in that process now of culling and seeing how many we're going to run. Um, but, and obviously some of our more traditional electives still sit there. But if you look at something like Cafe Claire and entrepreneurial learning, um, you know, it has a commerce lens. So it's not like we're throwing away um, some of the learning that sits in that space. It's just a reimagining. Reimagining the outcome, right? Yeah, it's good. So I'll go through a couple of the other questions I've got here and, and a couple of these that were in line with that, some of the thinking as well. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on your college's physical proximity to tertiary institutions and industry in order to create partnerships and to create authentic learning experiences, do you have any advice for regional schools and colleges to create similar opportunities? Yeah, and I think that slide I showed you um, that talks to that hybrid approach was really um, game changing. I think, you know, that's really allowed us to open up that, that landscape that anybody can come in. We had NASA 
I mean, obviously, we're never going to be able to get Alice Bowman in person, but she sat and engaged with those girls for an entire morning. Um, she did a presentation and, you know, that was a really amazing, authentic experience for the girls. Um, and if there's anything that we've learned, all you have to do is ask. Yeah, so can I ask you on that? Because um, to address Wayne's question there, I'm for, I led in a regional context and so um, I was really passionate on this as well. So, Kerry, how have you gone about, like, you've got people from the Archibald coming in and people from NASA coming in, like, you know, it's not just like, oh, yeah, I've got, you know, someone's mum, which is we, no problem with having a parent come in, but, you know, we're going top shelf here. How have you gone about that? You know, you just send a cold call email. Yeah, and, you know, and Hi, I'm Kerry. You should know who I am. I'm on the magazine <laughs> covers. Like, how did you go about that? No, look, I. It's amazing that we we hesitate in that space, um, and a lot of these big institutions are so keen to be involving kids, involving students. I mean, they're they're the future workers, leaders. Um, thinkers, innovators in our world, and they're absolutely wanting to provide a particular perspective for those students. And they're more than happy to get involved in this space. Um, and so often it's, it is about just going through the channels and asking, um, <laughs> think big, and, and off, more often than not, people come in and, and do this work with us. Yeah. And then, I, yeah. and then the flip side of that is they get to see some of the things that these students with and go, hang on a second, we've got, there's a whole shortage across the workforce. They go, hang on a second, have me. I'll, uh, I'll have a look at you as well. So, yeah. Um, next question is actually one that I would thought would be really good for you to unpack. How have you changed the timetable structure to support this amazing learning, e.g. longer lessons? And, and that's what I was going to say. Like, you know, the, the young lady produces, you know, a, a shadow address. Like, okay, that's 52 minutes. Can you stop your thinking and stop your creativity now? I now need you to go and think about something completely different. Yeah. What have you done with the timetable to it? To so I think it is about thinking a bit creatively with the timetable. So there are times where we just collapse the timetable altogether. Um, on project days, it is an entire day where all the girls work um, on a project. So, um, can, so, when, so can you, because I'm aware there's potentially some architects out here on on the online today as well and this would be good for them in their conversations with school when you say collapse a timetable for a day is that consistently so like once a fortnight or once a week or is it just a little bit you know depending on where they're at in the project and when you say collapse a project that just means that day they're working on their project can you just unpack that a little bit so uh we have a structure that sits around the projects and so one of them on the very first day it's that immersive um, opportunity where we have industry experts come in there are no timetabled lessons so we, instead of having those five structured lessons where the girls are going around you know to their their English math science teacher um, we we throw that out um, and we create a, a new timetable for that day for that entire year group and that requires us to have some really good flexible spaces in the school um, to be able to gather large and small groups together for workshops um, you know, that space where we actually have them work, you know, in the first instance where we launch a project. Um, it could be that if we're running um, a, for example, when we ran the, um, where the girls actually had to create a film, we had a short film festival, we launched it using that. Um, so, you know, the space in that context becomes important because it, it becomes that authentic lens that we're going to lend to the project in, in terms of the product. Um, and so, you know, it, it is about collapsing the timetable on certain days. Um, and so it could be whole afternoons, it could be whole days, and we do that throughout the term. And then the girls move around the school um, and move around the environment and work with experts in that context. So, for example, in one of the um, one of those days, we'll have labels up on rooms in our in our hub as breakout rooms. And instead of having the name of the, we have the name of the person and we don't have their title, we have their skill set that sits on the room. Um, and the girls, as they're working in, the, in their project space with their groups, they go to the room and work with that expert, that person who can provide them with the skills that they need to further their project moving forward. So it's about having opportunities like that that sit in the timetable, and that can happen anywhere, um, you know, to, to allow the students to actually move projects forward. And that's been a learning um, and something that we've been doing ongoing as well. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you about some learnings a little bit later. So if you think <laughs> about some of that, uh, that would be great because it's not like, you know, you start this on day one and, wow, everything was awesome all of a sudden. What are some of the learnings in there? Because 
um, potentially online with us this afternoon and some people go, geez, I love this idea. I want to take one, I want to take one infant step first, you know. So if you can just think about some learnings and, and some first steps. I have another question here. And it says, are students co-constructors in the design, planning, and activation of stage five programs? How do you coordinate the new experiences and staff planning time to implement these amazing experiences? Then they've all mm -hmm. just they've just said, well done with exclamation marks as well. Okay. <laughs> um, look, the with students, we absolutely see that student voice is a really important part of what we do. Um, and part of that reimagining of stage five electives was getting student voice, asking those questions. What are some of the things you'd like to see happening in the learning space? And um, really, it's also that feedback that comes from those stage four projects. I'd like to do more of. Um, you know, I don't want to just have coding and, and doing something in a, in a co-curricular context. We want to see it embedded um, in the curriculum itself. You know, the musical that we run, girls want to do that in a, in a learning context. And so there, there's opportunity. That's part of listening to that student voice in the construction of those projects um, definitely happens. Um, I think it's still something that we can do better, um, continually working on that. But I, that's definitely been a contributing factor. In terms of the staff professional learning, we reimagined what professional learning looks like. Um, and so once a fortnight on a Wednesday, we, we have um, a, a day zero timetable. So in order to protect learning across, across the timetable, um, if ever we have a day zero, it means that our lessons are shortened just by 10 minutes. Um, so if we have an assembly or we have something happening, we don't cancel lessons. We just reduce lessons by 10 minutes so that we can always protect learning time. So on every second Wednesday, we, we run a day zero timetable. We finish the school day at 2.10. Um, we open up the hub, the, the learning, the um, library, the old, it's not a library anymore, it's a learning hub. We open the hub for girls. We have our year 12, our senior mentors come in and they do some workshops and things with the girls. Um, and they, they run study hub and things in there. But we... Uh, we allow girls to go home and do their study as well, particularly our student, our senior students like that. But what happens is from 210 um, to from 225 to 425 is sustained professional learning time for staff. We've gotten rid of faculty meetings that don't exist. We hand out a curriculum memo um, that happens once a fortnight um, and they, that's gone. So it really allows us to have sustained time for staff that sits in and outside the timetable. So that one hour meeting that we found that wasn't as productive as it could be, um, no longer exists. We have targeted workshops and they're very hands-on workshops for staff that have a particular lens, a particular focus on what we're working on. It could be data that leads to a strategy that then allows staff to work in KLAs or across KLAs. Um, in order to bring to life some of the work that we want to do at school. And we found that that re and once a term we'll run a twilight where they have a three hour workshop session. We have um, teach meets and or we'll bring people in as well to work with the staff in that space. But it's really transformed that if we want girls to be collaborating and working across KLA, we have to set up some organisational structures for our staff so that they can be doing that and not working um, in the silos that we often see in school. So it's been really transformative and the staff have embraced it. Um, and it's amazing how inspired they get when they see some of these initiatives come to life and they have an opportunity to showcase them as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So I think I, I think a character trait often um, underappreciated in leadership is courage. Yeah. So um, would you have any, I don't know, words of advice, whatever else it be to, to, you know, any leaders that might be online, you know, as to how to take those steps to talk to, you know, take staff on that journey and take parents on that journey in, in regards to having the courage to embrace those conversations? Yeah. And, you know, we're always going to have that 10% in our schools that aren't necessarily going to um, love everything that we do. And that's okay. Um, you know, it's about meeting people where they're at. But a, a part of the success of this, um, you know, our students, we talk about student engagement. This has reinvigorated teachers and their engagement with learning, um, you know, providing them with some really authentic opportunities to be um, doing some passion work themselves has really allowed them to you know, to flourish. Not everything works and that's fine. Um, we want our students to take, you know, managed risks. We need to do the same. Um, and, you know, it is small steps at the beginning, 
um, and and working in that in that space where we know we're going to be successful with those ones that those staff that want to come on board um, and that you showcase what success can look like for them um, and for others and you know it has that run-on effect That's good. Um, so how do you how do you give your staff the courage once again I come back to because of your context which is in the eastern suburbs of Sydney surrounded by high performing schools surrounded by a number of you know ATAR is the uh, is the pinnacle type of school. How do you encourage your staff to take a risk, you know, with with some of the the new approaches to to what they're trying to do in that space? I think making academic rigor is always there. That's a really that's a non negotiable yep. bus. You know, <clears throat> there are expectations in and around making sure that girls have good, strong foundations in literacy and numeracy. Um, that we've got the scaffolds and structures in place, and I think. That's the key. Scaffolds and structures in every sense, not just for the students, but for the, the organisational structures that you have in place to make this type of work work. So, for example, we use a Canvas platform to house our projects. We use Understanding by Design as a frame, as a curriculum framework. Um, and you can see a project-based learning lens that sits within that. Um, we have one program that the staff work on um, so that they are working, they, that we use the essential questions of Understanding by Design. So the big question drives the learning and English, math, science, for example, come to that, that big question with their lens. Um, and so it, it's an opportunity for them to sort of rethink what learning looks like, but then having the leadership structures in place to support them um, in that process as well, so that they don't feel like it's more being added to their workload. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So some of those technologies that those young ladies have produced is seriously next level. To any architects online, let me tell you, your jobs are in danger because what those young ladies produced in their pop-up pods was unbelievable. They it's thought about the engineering, they thought about materials, they were next level, right? So one of the things that's always been interesting in, in education is like, oh, we've, we've got to, um, you know, like we introduced you to computer labs, right? And we'll take the students at our pace in regards to computers and we'll take the students at our pace in regards to technology. Fourth, fourth revolution, Mate, the students are way out there in, in regards to their understanding of technology, what they want to try in technology. How do your staff go with that as opposed to having this fear that, oh, my gosh, the kids are going to know more about some of this stuff and go beyond as, as opposed to, you know, I'm a DNT teacher, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a TAS teacher trained, you know. Like, oh, my gosh, all of a sudden these kids are designing things that are potentially going to go to market and, you know, that's that's not where my expertise lay. How, how do you take... How do you encourage your staff in that and also allowing the students to go above and beyond as to where they want to go? Uh, I think that's partly where some of those part that partnership work comes in as well. We have we all have expertise in different areas, but there's plenty of expertise that sits outside the classroom. Um, and it's about allowing mm -hmm. the staff to have an opportunity to bring those experts in and to work with them. Um, and to make sure that we're leveraging that expertise as well. Um, and that, you know, that authentic connection that exists, you saw some of those girls were taking their, the, that, that got taken to market, that app. There was another girl that um, recently put her app into, it was a, real, a really quirky take on Uber, a community-based Uber. Um, a, a industry expert found it some, and they, they sponsored her $5,000 so that she can bring it to market, pitch it, um, and, you know, it's just, it's about allowing the girls to be working. I mean, we've got the content knowledge in terms of our subject areas, um, but then allowing them to be able to make those connections outside that's going to see that learning live beyond school. Like It's lifelong. That from L project, that's lifelong. They're still doing that work. So, you know, there's some amazing connections that they can make that sit outside us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, once we get beyond, actually, um, we're doing this activity with the students because it's, it's an outcome box on a report, tick, actually, this is actually, this is for life. You know, yep. I know uh, when I introduced fitness to the students at school, all of a sudden wasn't PE anymore. It was fitness because actually everybody should yep. look after their fitness. And, and, and I think that that's what, what you're providing the, the students there. I have, had, I have had a request. Is it possible for educators to come and see uh, your school, meet with, meet with, you know, maybe yourself and some of the leadership team there at school? Yeah, absolutely. We've had um, 
We've had people come out and, and have a conversation with our staff and, you know, we're happy to, for you to have a conversation with students to take you through when, a, um, when something is happening in terms of a project and um, people, you know, more than happy to do that via Zoom or in person. Um, and yeah, definitely that's something that's definitely happened in the past. Fantastic. Another question for you from, uh, from our community. The role of the learning integrator, yep. how is that led? And do they connect, meet together to plan and look at the electives on offer? Yeah, definitely. So that was, uh, that has worked so well. That's only just happened this year. We introduced that at the start of this year. They actually just did a little presentation for us. And the whole point of the learning integrator was that we've got these amazing projects in stage four, but integrating this type of learning um, can happen across the curriculum in multiple ways. So those guys get two periods on their timetable and that isn't together. So those two lessons that they have is about them thinking about what, what I can be doing in, in our context, in our KLA, to bring this learning to life, whether it be in, this, in the context of a project or whether it be two faculties working together. So, for example, um, in a recent presentation, and this is where they come, they, they have um, opportunities to meet at our professional learning time, um, some of our PE department got together with our English faculty. English was doing... Is that um, to learn how to read and write? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, so <laughs> English, <laughs> English was doing Romeo and Juliet, so a coming-of-age text. And PDHPE were doing risk-taking and, you know, what it means within a, a PDHPE context of developmental Did they have to learn how to ask a girl? Coming of age. Taking so, yeah, so they did a really cool project where um, they actually... They did some work on the the language around and the the um, what's happening to the to the students from a um, you know how how they actually engage with the world in that risk taking space. Um, the PDHP department got you know a whole lot of beer goggles out, for example, for something really practical. Um, and they so it was really amazing initiatives that that they do coming together. But you would never think of Romeo and Juliet and you know that whole idea of PDHP coming together, looking at risk taking, looking at how, you know, I mean obviously that's an extreme version of um, not dealing with my emotions in Romeo and Juliet. Um, but so it's that whole idea of how do we connect and integrate learning across our curriculum. They had a resource that was used in one that got used in another. And so it's making those transferable connections across KLAs. I mean, every sense of the word that has that been some of that really exciting work for the learning integrators. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, fun story. I'm from an era where at school we actually got a physical dance card and we had to go and ask girls to dance certain dances <laughs> with us at the school dance. So I learned that risk-taking uh, skill very early on. That's excellent. Hey, I also want to talk to you about social enterprise, because uh, entrepreneurship, because I think that's outstanding. All right, there's uh, entrepreneurship, we know, and different schools will be at different journeys in that space. But the social element, as opposed to just being a purely, I'm going to make a lot of money for myself and I'm going to be my own boss type of thing. Mm. How have you gone about connecting hearts and minds there for your students and also your families that actually the importance of social entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, I think in our context, um, that service element of what we are, what we do in a Catholic school is really significant. Um, and students want to make a purposeful, meaningful difference in the world. And I think having that lens, there's a danger that exists in our current context that, you know, that whole idea that anyone can invent, anybody can create, um, that innovation um, for innovation's sake an AI potentially going too far, um, that we need to bring back that ethical lens that sits in that space. And I think that's been a really important part of why we've gone about um, undertaking entrepreneurship with a social justice lens so that the girls can actually make a, uh, that contribution. Um, and, you know, if you look at that, if you look at some of the um, important documents that are coming out in the education space from the World Economic Forum, um, it, it talks to those ideas of having civic-minded 
um, citizens. And, and, and this is a really important part of what we need to bring to the education space that, you know, we, we have a lens on sustainability when we do things, um, that we are looking for opportunities to make the world a better place for everybody that exists in it. And our girls, we live in the eastern suburbs. Our girls are privileged. Um, we need to get them to be looking outward as opposed to inward looking, um, you know, and never before has it been more important to, you know, act for civic intent rather than selfish intention. So, you know, that's just part of who we are. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think that's really, really good. And unfortunately, we don't do enough to, to you know, we, we talk about body, mind and soul, right? And uh, and I think sometimes we miss what that what that, that soul element looks like. So to bring that in meaningfully, I think is really important. And to bring it in in such a way that's not just about your own soul, but it's actually how you're making a difference in the lives of others is, uh, yeah, we, we talk about it in primary school, right? Yeah. And for some reason, as we get older, we think those lessons don't matter as much anymore. So, uh, so I think that's outstanding, um, Kerry. Um, I'm just seeing, it uh, looks like where uh, our comments there have uh, dried up for now, because we've got a number of architects on uh, online today as well. You mentioned about your Lumos Centre that you're, you're looking at doing. Can you actually just talk to us then about some of your some of what you think this means spatially like if we're doing blended learning you know therefore we might not need as many classrooms or we need a different classroom with different technologies in it. if we've got students developing iSTEM you know uh courses and whatnot that they're doing and things like that like we talk if you're doing blended learning that doesn't mean just nine to three now so no. therefore that would have impacts on on you know space and stuff like that so you can talk to us about what your thoughts are just you know um what this means in a learning environment yeah and i think hybrid learning is here to stay hybrid work is, mm. is here to stay and you know flexibility is key i think in a learning environment the the whole you know setting up a box for us to pack 30 students in and <laughs> me being the sage on the stage is gone um more and more it's been it's more and more important for us to be providing those opportunities for students to work collaboratively and flexibly um, and to be able to move so that the beauty of that new space is that it is going to reflect um, that design thinking process it won't look like traditional classrooms and that's been purposeful um, for us to really allow students to be working in the space with an understanding of how that space can actually reflect the learning process the thinking process um, and so part of that has been a really important consideration in terms of the building, um, you know, that ideation space and what does that look like? How can I work um, effectively collaborating um, with a big group, but also with a small group? How do I break away um, and, just, um, and just work either on my own for this time or work with just one or two others? And so having that flexibility in those spaces um, is really important and those opportunities to, you know, to to draw and write and, and create um, in those environments is, is been a, a, an important consideration. One of the yeah. When, yeah, one of the other things that's been really important for us is showcasing. Um, and so part of that space is going to have that showcase lens. Um, so where you know the front will be showcasing what learning looks like. Um, and that digital immersive experience will be part of that as well. Yeah, that's great. And you know, for the architects and line of um, I'm not sure who's with this today, but I've had a chance to work with with a number of them. I would imagine my current role, and even in my previous school, you know, I used to talk about certain spaces just should not feel like a school. So when we talk about an ideation space, if you think about the industries that are in ideation spaces, whether it is architects, whether it's guys in tech nut labs or whatever it be, they're not sitting in a room that's like a cream gyp rock, you know, um, with with the grey carpet with the orange fleck through it. Actually, that's not that's not their space. They're sitting in in rooms, mm -hmm. you know, industrial ceiling. You can see the the bones of the building, uh, the the textures that we use and things like that. So I think that how we bring that into space, spatial feel in different schools, so the students are aware when they walk into a different area. Actually, I don't. I actually I feel like I'm in like a science laboratory because I'm going to be working with NASA. You know, um, and so I think that I think that. Yeah, as we keep exploring then what that means in the textures that we use, in the materials that we use um, in schools becomes really important and how we create those spaces for the students. So, um, yeah, art, art rooms should feel like when they're working with Archibald artists, they should feel like they're actually in an artist's studio 
not just in a GLA that happens to have a laminate floor. Yeah, and I think that's less and less important now. Having those GLAs, you know, in that right. like the the cur the curriculum is changing and evolving. There's a new curriculum coming in. Um, this there's a, a, a explicit focus on this notion of collaboration and us moving um, into more flexible environments. And I think that you know the spaces really need to reflect that. Um, interesting space in the in the tertiary sector is that whole blended approach with you know that that zoom coming in and you know some students in situ and that's where we're headed flexible timetables you wow. know we're moving beyond the the nine to three space the eight thirty so to if you have the opportunity to send any of your students so instead of like you you know like you've got new south wales uni and a couple of others close by have you had the opportunity then for your students actually to base themselves in some of those spaces for these yeah. lessons instead of it just trying to be in school all the time? Yeah, we have. We have had some students who have gone out and done some work. So one of our um, chemistry girls has gone out and worked in the 3D um, design lab at University of New South Wales and has created the most ridiculous you know, 3D imaging of chemical, I don't even know what she does, but it's amazing. Um, so it's just... It's just you, want, so you want the specialist on the door for that lesson? Yeah, no. Yeah. So, but if that's what they do. They go out and work in, right. those, in those contexts and it brings learning to life for them. Absolutely, because um, when you talk about hybrid learning, well, it doesn't just need to be in room 1.6. Actually, that could be in the city. Yep. Right? Yep. Wherever it be, they could be down at the university, wherever. And so I think as schools... And school leaders, the challenge there is, okay, how do I, you know, how do I look after the, the well-being and safety, but how do I release them into the freedom and potential that this world has to offer them, you know, mm -hmm. like, do I have to do history in the classroom or can I actually base myself at the, the museum? Yep. It's exciting. Every Thursday afternoon, I go to the museum to work Miss McDiamond. Okay, great. Yep. And I think that's the challenge for us, isn't it, you know? Because schools are control freaks. Yeah, right? absolutely. Because you're the master of your domain. <laughs> So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that's an interesting, interesting, and I think that comes back to the importance of those relationships and partnerships. Um, you know, I was fortunate, as I mentioned, to be in a regional area, and there was vineyard owners were happy for us to run viticulture on their site. Amazing. You know, we ran tourism events in the tourist office and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So, um, if there's any other questions, oh, I think one more has come through. Um, make sure. Ah, uh, yeah. Digital portfolios. Thank you, Linda. In your digital portfolios, are the students reflecting on their dispositions, e.g. collaboration that they have used in their project? And is this used as their assessment or micro-credential? Is the digital portfolio used as a reporting conversation to parents? Yeah, so that's the space that we're heading into now. So creating these digital portfolios mm -hmm. because with you know more and more and you know you know the department's moving into this space themselves but more and more it's not about uh, a mark that sits at the end of my educational experience and universities are using portfolios for students to actually um, enter the university space but um, what we do in terms of assessment is that there is a real focus on the process product um, so 50% of that work that they do, process work is marked and product work marked. Um, and part of that, we, we do have those dispositions built into a set of criteria that the girls need to engage with um, that look to collaboration. We set up structures at the beginning where um, they have to create a little contract with their group that talks to what effective collaboration looks like. Um, all those sort of um, formative things that happen along the way. But it, it's that 50-50 split with those projects that's really interesting in terms of process and product. And for some of our more able students, that's a challenge. Um, they've figured out the system. They know how to get an A. But when I have to work all the way along the process, um, that becomes an inch and work with people and be, you know, assessed on what that looks like, um, that, that becomes an interesting challenge. It's definitely something that we are um, that is, is a space that we need to continue to work in um, and measuring some of that stuff in terms of data is interesting for critical thinking and, and notions of collaboration. It's, it's a project for, for, that's been worked on this year. Fantastic. Kerry, you are inspirational and engaging <laughs> and uh, I really want to thank you for sharing some of your insights, journeys, successes along the way. Uh, I just love talking with you about life but in particular what you're doing in the education space 
Um, it's a real privilege to be able to work with you. And I really want to thank you because I know that this year has been rather hectic for educators and for school leaders. And term three, wellbeing data suggests that week seven is the lowest point in, uh, for, in wellbeing for education. Um, and so you've just come out of that. And so I want to thank you for, uh, for sharing with us this afternoon when I know you've got a lot of other things coming on. All the best with your current, you know, year 12s in particular as you wrap up term three. And, uh, and I trust that you and your staff are maintaining really good mental and physical health and well-being as you finish term three. And, uh, and uh, thanks once again. I'm going to hand over to Joe, who will uh, who'll wrap us up for the afternoon. All right, uh, hang on, where am I? Um, yes, just want to echo Darren's sentiments. Kerry, um, you are an inspiration. Thanks so much. I actually learnt a lot then myself. I was writing lots of notes, but um, it's been a pleasure working with you and thank you so much. And Darren, your energy as always, um, facilitating these conversations is much appreciated. So I'm sure that um, our entire audience got a lot out of this afternoon, whether you're an architect or an educator. Um, so thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Just keep an eye out for um, emails about the RDO coming up in November. We'd love to see you there, connecting people um, and place and country um, in Parramatta. So um, hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.